Shakespeare's Cymbeline. All right. To continue. Right? Yes. Go. Do it. Yes. Go. So Act 2 concludes with Yakimo coming home and, and bragging to Posthumus and saying, yeah, I totally did it, here's the proof. Now we see Posthumus in a pretty bad light. And we see an interesting contrast here between Imogen and Posthumus. After all, when Imogen was hearing this story about Posthumus and how awful he was being and how he was sleeping with all the ladies of Italy, she didn't buy it. And she fought against it and ultimately she overcame the deception of Yakimo. However, when Posthumus is listening to Yakimo, he completely buys into the story, and a little bit too quickly. In fact, Posthumus... Oh, hush. We got a paper. I have paper. Valerio, uh, Posthumus's friend, is less willing to believe Yakimo and more willing to trust Imogen than Posthumus himself, which is pretty lame that the, the husband can't believe her, but the guy who's never met her does. When Yakimo presents some sort of shady evidence, Posthumus is like, yeah, she did it, she cheated on me. And Flaherty's like, wait, 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 maybe maybe he got that detail from some of the servants, or maybe this the bracelet was stolen, maybe this not clear evidence. But ultimately, even Flaherty's word is overthrown, and Posthumus completely buys into Yakimo and gives him the ring and storms out in such anger. He's just overcome by rage against Imogen that he's about to act very, very rash and regret it later on. So as Act 3 begins, uh, we're back at the court uh, of Cymbeline, and we see that tension between Rome and, and Britain. Now, the king, Cymbeline, uh, with the prompting of the queen, has decided to make war on the Romans. Now, if you remember your history, Julius Caesar was the great general who took over the whole world and marched all the way up into Britain and took over Britain and made Britain part of the Roman Empire. Well, now here we are under Caesar Augustus, no longer Julius, and Cymbeline does not want to bear the rule of Rome anymore. He wants to go back to being independent and autonomous and having only um, British rule. So, as he gets to uh, gets the message from Rome that they're angry that he hasn't paid tribute in a while, he says, ah, I've decided to throw off Rome and um, instead uh, become independent. And so, um, we're getting to that, that subplot is beginning to develop, which is going to be very important later on, because after all, where is Posthumus? He's in Rome, and he's on the other side. Uh, and that duality, that two-sidedness, is going to be important for the end of the play. Next, we see the outcome of Posthumus's rage, which is to send a letter to his faithful servant Pisanio and say, hey, Pisanio, my faithful, faithful servant, your mistress, the lady that you are serving, is evil because she's cheated on me. Therefore, I want you to murder her. And here's a clever way to do it. Why don't you invite her to the city of Milford Haven and say that I will meet her there. And, uh, and once you're out on the road alone, then you can murder her and get away with it. So make sure you kill her for me because after all, I hate her now that she did this awful thing to me. And so Pisania is reading this letter and he's completely blown away by it because um, it's the most untrue thing in the world. He knows that she's been so faithful, and he's just awed by it. He doesn't know what to do by it, and Imogen runs into him and says, Hey, what's going on, Pisanio? And he doesn't know what to say, and so he gives her the uh, fake letter that, um, that Posthumus sent, inviting her to Milford Haven, saying, Hey, I'll meet you there, sweetie. <laughs> and so Imogen believes it, and she's completely overcome by her excitement and joy at the thought of seeing her beloved, sweet, loving Posthumus again. Um, meanwhile, Posthumus is raving and wants to kill her. Imogen commands him to uh, get ready and they're gonna sneak out and they're gonna go to Milford Haven and see Posthumus again. And then we run into our um, two other very important characters, or three other very important characters, uh, who happen to be Imogen's brothers. And I already mentioned them earlier, but um, Imogen's brothers, whose names are Guiderius and Alvergus, or something like that. Alvergus? Alvergus? Anyway, they're actually disguised as British peasants out in the mountains. 
because the, the man who they think is their father was a man who was banished by King Cymbeline. Cymbeline tends to banish people or attempt to kill people uh, for really dumb reasons. Uh, he jumps to conclusions and, and attempts to hurt people um, without getting the full story, just as Posthumus jumped to conclusions about Imogen. But Cymbeline was told that uh, this guy was actually a Roman spy way back when, and so he attempted to kill him, and in revenge as treason, uh, the man ran off with his two children and hid out in the woods in a cave. But as the boys grew up, they showed their true character. In fact, most of um, the talk of their adopted father about them is about how their true natures are shining through uh, in spite of the fact that they've been raised in a cave as peasants who do hunting all the time. They're acting very princely and very kingly all throughout. Valerius points out that these are the lost sons of the king, Cymbeline. The two-sided to two-sided. And we're back to Imogen with uh, Pisanio as they're going to Milford Haven and Imogen's just going on and on about how she's excited she is. Um, and she's wondering why Pisanio looks so awful. Pisanio's really not happy and looking really sad and looking really uh, confused. And finally, she says, you know, what's up? What, why aren't you excited? You should be excited to see your master posthumous. He's awesome. And Pisanio finally hands her the letter asking uh, Pisanio to murder her. And as he says, he doesn't, didn't have to murder her because the, the, the letter itself almost seems to, to murder her. It cuts her throat just to, to see uh, Posthumus saying these things about her. And she is completely horrified by it. And her only conclusion is, after all the things that Yakimo said, that Posthumus must have fallen for some other woman and she wanted to get her out of the way or something like that. And uh, she's ready to die. And so she said, Bassanio, just go ahead and kill me. I'm ready to die. I can't do this. I can't take this. Just please, please kill me. So Bassanio instead says he believes that Posthumus is being tricked into this. And he, he wants to have another solution. And the solution for him is to dress her up as a boy and send her down to Rome to hang out near where uh, Posthumus is and try to figure out what exactly is happening with him. Meanwhile, Pisanio will send a message to Posthumus that he has killed Imogen and some fake proof that uh, that he's killed Imogen and maybe Posthumus will feel bad about it all and in his grief uh, it will be revealed what happened and then once everything's cleared up then Imogen can reveal that she's still alive again. Now incidentally you've seen plots like this before in Shakespeare, it's pretty common. However this one goes awry. So back at the court, Cymbeline and the Queen have n suddenly realized the absence of Imogen and they're upset and they're wondering what's going on and Clotten, who's been trying and trying and trying to win her over and she won't have it and and he's so ticked at her for not being completely in love with him. And earlier she had said that uh, she valued the clothes off of Posthumus' back more than she valued Clotten and all of his good qualities, which she didn't think very much of. And that really irritated Clotten. And so when he discovers that she's run off, he thinks that she's run off to be with Posthumus, which is true, I mean, I guess, technically. And, uh, and so he gets so upset, uh, he corners Pisanio and gets the fake truth out of him, which is that she's run off to Milford Haven to be with Posthumus. Pisanio shows him the original fake letter, and so Clotten, in a rage, decides he's going to go off and, and uh, stop her. And, uh, and do some other things. But first, he asked Pisanio to get him the clothes of Posthumus that are still here in the house. And so Pisanio gives him Posthumus clothes because what Clotten's brilliant idea is that he's going to wear the clothes of Posthumus, the clothes that Imogen valued more than she valued Clotten himself. And he's going to go down there and first slaughter Posthumus right in front of Imogen's face, and then he's going to rape Imogen. And so we see him as a really horrifying, really vengeful, very angry character here at this point. He's been angry and violent throughout the whole play, and stupid too, but now he's showing himself as being just about as horrifying as he could possibly be, and he has really very evil plans for Imogen, and he heads off down the road. So meanwhile, Imogen, wandering alone and starving and dressed like a boy, wanders to the cave of her brothers. Oh, 
How amazing. What uh, coincidence. How romantic. She arrives at the cave of her brothers and calls herself Fides. What an interesting name choice. She chooses a name that means faithful as her cover name because of the, the charge against her that she was unfaithful to her husband. So when her brothers see her, they completely are enamored with her and thinking she's a guy. And they, they say, oh, what a handsome young man. What an amazing young guy. I love this guy. I feel like this guy's my brother. Turns out it's not their brother. It's their sister. But they feel this strong connection to her and they decide to treat her very well. They invite her in. They give her food. They take care of her. Meanwhile, Clotten is hot on the trail. He's looking for her and heading to Milford Haven, attempting to find her and Posthumus and do his evil plan. And as he's running through this area, we get to the point where Belarius and the two boys, uh, Imogen's brothers, are going out hunting, and Imogen, feeling very sick at heart, decides to stay in. And they're both the, the boys are so unhappy because their new friend and adopted little brother Fides is feeling so sick and so they tell her that they're so sorry that she's so sick and they wonder if they can stay in and help her but she's like no 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 you go on and she is very very depressed and so she decides in her depression to take the medicine that Pisanio gave her which is supposed to be that cure-all that makes everything better it turns out that this medicine is the poisons from the queen now fortunately they aren't real poisons the queen thought they were but they aren't and so when Fides slash Imogen takes the medicine, which is actually a sleeping potion, she falls into what appears to be death. And so she, she, she seems as though she's dead, much like the drug that Romeo takes in Romeo and Juliet that causes Juliet to think he's dead. And so we have that same sort of plot line, similar to the Snow White thing. We have our princess who's lost in the woods and is now fallen to what looks like death from the evil queen slash evil stepmother. Her brothers, who are out hunting, run into Clotten, who, uh, when they see Clotten, Valerius recognizes him and says, oh no, it's Clotten. Oh no, we better stay away. So, but Clotten confronts Guiderius, who is the elder brother, the elder prince, and uh, challenges him and says he's a vagabond and uh, I'm a highwayman or whatever, and picks a fight and attempts to fight because Let's face it, Clotten's always trying to pick a fight. And Guiderius shows his mettle, shows the stuff that he's made of, and he shows that he's a good fighter, he shows that he's brave and not willing to back down from this kind of insult. And he fights Clotten and kills him in self-defense. And Clotten would have, of course, murdered Guiderius without a second thought, but Guiderius winds up cutting off his head. And so Clotten is dead, pretty horrifically. But he definitely deserved it. He had it coming. Um, he was going to do horrible things, but the idea of having his head chopped off and left without a head, it's pretty intense. So Guiderius throws the head in the river and lets it wash away. They decide that they're done with hunting because that was kind of disturbing, the fact that uh, that they ran into Clotten, and also the fact that now that Clotten is dead, Valerius is worried that the king's court will come after them and finally find them out in their hideout after all these years. So, um, they're upset, they decide to go home, but when they get home, they discover, oh dear sweet, Fides is dead. So they're upset about that too, and they don't know what to do. They sing a song for poor Imogen slash Fides, which is a very famous poem from Shakespeare. It's very pretty. Uh, and they mourn for him, and they decide that um, they will lay Fides beside the corpse of Clotten, because after all, although Clotten was awful um, and a terrible person, they, he was a prince, and therefore he deserves a prince's, prince's uh, burial. He deserves some respect, and so they lay Clotten and Fides side by side. Now, what happens next? Well, Imogen wakes up and finds the body of a man lying next to her, and guess what that man's wearing? That's right, it's wearing Posthumus's clothing. And so when she sees that dead body there, and she sees, it's missing a head, so she can't recognize the face, obviously, um, and Clotten's about the same size as Posthumus, she thinks that this is Posthumus, this is her husband, and her grief just completely overcomes her. And, uh, and she is so very, very uh, distraught at finding her husband dead. Paper misfeed, paper misfeed, ah! And 
I fixed it. That's right, functional, fully functional. 